Hey, futurists. If you enjoy thinking about the future as much as we do, we'd love to connect with you. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Hence the Future and on our website at HenceTheFuture.com. Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Justin Clark. I'm Matt Amor Cronin. And today we're discussing the future of forensics. So that means we'll be discussing some of the cutting edge forensic techniques that exist today and also which techniques are going to emerge in the future. Um, but first, Matt Amor, maybe explain to listeners why we're talking about this right now. Yeah, forensics has been in the news lately. The biggest story has been around the Golden State Killer. And there have been some stories since then using similar techniques. And that technique is genetic forensics. Basically, there are sites now like 23andMe, like Ancestry.com, where you can upload your DNA to a database and find who your relatives are, where you came from, your ancestry, and that sort of thing. And there are aggregator sites as well, like one called GEDmatch. And GEDmatch basically allows anyone, no matter where they got their DNA analyzed, whether it's 23andMe or Ancestry or whatever, they can upload it there and just get access to a much greater slew of people. So with the Golden State Killer, I mean, this guy had been committing murders for decades and decades. No one could catch him. He would sneak into rooms and assault people and kill people. And they weren't able to find him until this new technique became available. And mm -hmm. even though they had this guy's DNA, you know, in earlier days, there was no match in the criminal DNA database. You have to have committed a serious crime, like a felony or something, to be in the, da the database that, criminal, that uh, law enforcement has had up until recently. Mm. Yeah. But with these new sites like Ancestry.com and GEDmatch, they were able to find that, okay, this Golden State Killer, his DNA is similar enough to these other people's DNA that we know that these people who are in the GEDmatch database are his great-great-grandparents. So they basically were able to narrow it down, uh, still in a very broad way, but then... But they knew that he was related to these people They knew he was related, way. so now they had a narrow group of suspects, and they were interested by one of the people who was within this pool of suspects who happened to live by the Bay Area. He was a disgraced cop, and he had purchased firearms right around the time of some of the killings. So this guy wow. instantly had a red flag. And basically what the, uh, what the law enforcement did then is that they staked out his house. They waited for him to dispose of something like a coffee cup. And then they analyzed the DNA. They found that it was a match. They arrested him. They took him to trial. And that's how they got him. And yeah, that's crazy that, you know, it, you can just analyze the data of relatives and you know that that narrows down the search and that's really good in some sense but in another sense it's you know what what does this lead to does this lead to um, countries I know there's a few that are talking about starting DNA banks in general where everybody right DNA, compulsory DNA yeah rather than like samples just, yeah so that that would be scary but in a way it, I guess it kind of depends on what country you're well, talking about. Well, I found one interesting thing about this whole DNA genetic genealogy thing is that most of the people that upload to these sites are mm -hmm. older white people who are interested in their heritage. Yeah. And the interesting thing is that it kind of levels the playing field, um, you know, and makes it more unbiased of a pool of people that may be a match in a DNA database because previously it was just the criminal database and because there has oh. been some discriminatory policing, they tend to be African Americans, uh, you know, lower yeah. economic status. But this group is largely white, rural, older Americans. So now, and, and I saw one stat that said that something like 90 or 95 percent of all of, of all Americans can now be identified through this genetic database, even though a very small percentage has actually uploaded their, their DNA data, just because we're so interconnected. So yeah. genetic privacy 
is is pretty much a thing of the past already. Yeah. So, what it, have you ever done? Twenty three and Me or I would any never, of those? I would never do it because yeah. you don't know how private companies or future government administrations will use that data. I just yeah. like the upside of knowing. Oh, I might be. You know, some of my ancestors came from Spain. Like the upside of knowing that versus the you know even if it's a very small chance of someone creating like a disease specifically yeah. targeting your dna like I, I would i just don't see the cost benefit doesn't make sense to me at all yeah i i haven't done it either but i do know that there's also some some health benefit not necessarily health benefits of doing it but you might be informed that you're more prone to something like right. alzheimer's or something that you know so you can worry I, I more can, <laughs> yeah, I, I see why people are interested in doing it. But um, the other thing is uh, 23andMe doesn't sequence your whole, whole genome. It's only like a partial genome. And that's mm. that's enough. You don't need the whole genome to really match evidence or DNA evidence to specific users or specific people. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of other really interesting types of... Yeah, let's talk about too. the other current cutting edge <laughs> forensic techniques. Well, first, I just want to point out a couple of really fringe ones that I found okay. kind of interesting. Yeah. So one was uh, palynology, which is hmm. basically studying of um, pollen and spores, where you like on people's um, clothing or something else, where you can kind of determine where these people have been, because a lot of times plants will have. Um, specific locations within the world that like they only exist there so you can tell right. where someone has been by examining um, you know the pollen and like uh, maybe fungi spores or something on them yeah I don't know why I found that one well, interesting, well that but... is interesting I found a similar thing around you know microbiome testing mm. is something that is emerging this is probably goes in the category of future forensic techniques but basically, every person has a unique microbiome. Even two people that are living together will have different microorganisms living on them in a symbiotic relationship with their, their body. And you can analyze these and figure out whose cell phone something is, who was holding this knife, that kind of thing. And it's kind of like the micro version of another forensic technique that has been in existence in a, for a long time, which is entomology which is the study of bugs. Yeah. And if you think about like, you know, when someone gets murdered, how do you figure out the time of death? Um, you know, bugs have been a big indicator of that because when someone dies, blowflies come, they lay eggs, usually in the soft parts of the body, like the eyes, the groin, or if there was like a stab wound, you know, that's an open area that they would lay, mm -hmm. lay their eggs. And then you can tell by the age of the larva which areas may have been the wounded area. And you can also tell, okay, based on how old this larva is, how big it is, here's how long ago this person is likely to have died. And then after all yeah. of the flies have eaten all the soft, fleshy stuff, then the beetles come and they get more of like the cartilage and the stuff that's, that's you know, yeah. a little tougher, drier. And then finally, the moths and the mites come and they get your hair. And then, you know, ultimately, all you're left with is a skeleton. So mm -hmm. you can very, I mean, not exactly like 3 p.m. Tuesday, but you can say like between four and five days ago, this person died. And that's potentially really important information oh, for yeah. a case. Um, yeah, that was that was another one of those interesting ones. And do you know how long that's been around? Um it seems it's been around for a long time. I mean, it, okay. I mean, since since ancient history, there are references like in Egyptian, ancient Egypt, where they'll, you know, they'll they'll recognize the different patterns of bugs that come. I was interested to find that even fingerprinting has been around since 300 BC in China, and there was a text written in China around that time that basically showed that, oh yeah, people have different fingerprints and you can identify them that way. And then- Imagine doing that in ancient China, like I with know. no computers, nothing, just like, that was probably a person that had to look at the patterns. Well, even until, I mean, I even until very recently, they've had a pr pretty manual way of doing it. I mean, computers have really? been around for, you know, 
very, a very shorter amount of time. So what they used to have is they had this method of classification, much like in a library, where you have all these pigeonholes of different fingerprints of all the people who have been, you know, fingerprinted in your town. And every fingerprint falls into one of eight basic categories. Like I've got, you know, sort of like the slanted circular pattern. Some people have two, but anyways, you can basically say, okay, what kind of fingerprint is this? And then you go over to whichever eight of those types it is. And then you okay. kind of hone in on the exact type of variation. You're like, oh, this is the guy, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> He's the one, <laughs> but now obviously you just, you know, scan it on a computer and it'll instantly match with like percentage mm -hmm. of confidence interval and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's the other thing to point out is none of these are, you know, a surefire way of figuring out exactly who a person or who a Yeah. You need supporting evidence. They, uh -huh. they might, they probably won't work on them. Even DNA, if it's perfect match, even then it's hard to win in court if there's not you know, circumstantial evidence supporting it. Yeah. And the other thing that's kind of scary about DNA evidence in particular is, uh, so there's this one case, um, that I read about, there's this guy named John Schneeberger. Um, he was a, he was someone who, uh, was a doctor in Canada, but he raped a patient, uh, that was sedated and also his stepdaughter. But, um, he had like there were traces of semen on the um, victim's clothing but he actually injected himself with so it was some sort of um blood um let's see let me see exactly what it was but it was a um, blood sample that he faked basically so the uh forensic scientists thought mm. that it was somebody else so he faked his own dna evidence and got away with it for a really long time until someone hired a private investigator to um, get another DNA sample. But yeah, that's a that's... problem. People can falsify this kind of stuff, especially a medical doctor that kind of knows how this stuff works. Right. Or any person of authority. Like, I mean, cops planting DNA evidence is, yeah, 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 is yeah. a big thing. And I mean, that's one, one thing I, I recognized in my research as well is that documenting the process is so key in having the evidence hold up well in court. So mm -hmm. forensic uh, technicians who do their job well, they'll document every part of the process, like from the first mm -hmm. time they arrive on scene to going, starting from the outside, sort of moving in to bagging all the evidence. Like, so I think that that's going to be an even more important part because you know, DNA evidence and all of these futuristic methods, they're good so long as they're used in the right way. But if they're mm -hmm. used by people in power to distort the truth, then mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's just as powerful in the in the wrong direction rather than the right direction. Yeah. And um, the other another type of forensic science is um, video forensics. Like, you know, like we talked about in the future yeah. of facial recognition. So you can, if there were cameras somewhere, yeah, you can kind of see where someone has been, which direction they were going, stuff like that. But in addition to that, we've also seen the rise of deep fakes. So mm -hmm. is there a possibility that people start planting like a deep fake type of evidence to frame people within for crimes or something that they that seems commit. that seems difficult to like get a deep fake onto some surveillance system i mean it that, probably depends on the like the surveillance system itself yeah but, but it I, also depends on how much power you have you know if you can yeah i mean at least right now people are able to detect if something is a deep fake but yeah in mm -hmm. the future it could be that could be something to to keep an eye on when it's I'm, also well, just one thing about that is a lot of the videos are pixelated. It's not like a high def video like a lot of the deep fakes are trying to be. It's just like some far off pixelated person that you can kind of see at, is a specific type of person is or is a specific person, but it's still pixelated enough to where the deep fake might be almost as close to what a real pixelated person would look like. So Yeah, I mean, that would... To me, that would only work in an, in a corrupt situation, and there may be easier ways for corrupt individuals to get what they want yeah. than that. 
Fair enough. So it's worth noting, but I'm not that concerned about that. But mm-hmm. one thing, I, one thing I do think is really relevant as it relates to facial recognition and surveillance is the idea that you can reconstruct someone's face from their skull, and you know, even if there's no cartilage or muscle, they now have the ability to reconstruct what someone's face probably looks like, which is really important for identifying a victim. And you can actually analyze someone's DNA. And just like a police sketch artist, you can actually construct what this person is likely to look like based on their DNA. Mm. So you this can... is the phenotype reconstruction. Is that what yeah, it's called? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's not perfect because we won't always know when genes will express themselves, but it's mm-hmm. pretty good. I mean, it's, it's a lot better than not having the evidence at all. Like you can tell, okay, this person is a... South, a man of Southeast Asian descent between the mm-hmm. ages of 34 and 37. And they have mm. this color eye, this color hair, you know, of this build. Yeah. Like, it's pretty damn good when you're when you're narrowing down suspects. Yeah. Again, it's a probabilistic, like given given the DNA, what what is the likely um, like con- reconstruction of this person. And you could probably, um, I didn't go into the details of phenotype reconstruction, but it seems like they could also um, reconstruct several different possibilities. Um, yeah, given the, yeah. So it's probably like a simulation where you can kind of see, okay, and there's a bunch of different ways that it could go, but in general, this is sort of the um, what we can expect this person to look like. Yeah. Yeah, and the other area that, has changed a lot over the years with forensics is toxicology. So mm-hmm. anyone who's been a fan of Shakespeare knows that poison is a is a common trope, especially the mm-hmm. femme, the femme fatale image. You know, just another spoonful of your sugar will help you feel better, and really, it's arsenic. <laughs> you know, p- society has been so interested in the femme fatale, and mm. the data does show that that is the most common way that women tend to kill people is I was looking Mm. at this, this data study of how men and women kill people differently. And Mm -hmm. obviously men kill much more often. Men tend to kill women who they don't know, like who are strangers for sexual reasons. Like they'll, that's, that's the Mm. majority of male murders. The Mm. majority of female murders are, men who they know who are in their life for monetary reasons and, oh, and so it's just like a, oh oh and the way that that women kill is by poisoning and the way that men kill is by strangulation more Jeez. often than not so that that gives you a pretty good insight into men and women if you know nothing else and yeah it's like the at the extremes, how, how are these people right. behaving? Like the worst possible version of a woman is someone who like deceives you and poisons you while acting nice. And the worst version of a man is like someone who just like strangles you and assaults you. and Yeah, like hyper aggressive, like, hyper sexual, yeah. like just, yeah, totally misplaced masculinity, I guess. Yeah. But I find that interesting because toxicology used to be a much bigger problem. I mean, there were so many murders all throughout the Roman Empire, the Middle Ages, you know, all through even the 19th century, some of the 20th century. But lately, we've gotten a lot better at detecting levels of arsenic or, you know, excessive levels of insulin or ricin or any of these other poisons in the body. And it's common practice now that when you test a body for poison, you'll also test the soil t- nearby to make sure that there's not natural, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, elements of that in the soil. And because we've gotten so good at detecting different poisons, the number of poison related deaths has gone way down. And it's hmm. really hard to poison someone and get away with it now, which is a good thing. Yeah, it is. And that's also, it draws parallels to forensic epidemiology, where, for example, there might be a court case about some, some plant, for example, that is polluting the environment, and then people around have a really high instance of cancer. Yeah. Well, one interesting toxicology case is the radon girls. 
I don't know if you read about those in your research, but no. basically back in the day, I forget when this was, like the 60s or something, all the rage was to use radium and other radioactive elements to create glowing products. Whoa. You could have these glowing nail polish or this glowing, like, oh. basically they had all of this glow in the dark stuff that they sold everywhere. And, you know, the powers that be like just really made sure that no information came out about how negative the health impacts are like similar to smoking similar to so much that we've discussed in this podcast mm. but basically these women kept dying 25 year old women 28 year old women all of these women kept dying and they had the same sort of progression where their bones would get weak their hair would fall out they'd have low energy and they would just slowly deteriorate and through toxicology they were able to find that these women had been exposed to so much of, of this radioactive material that that's what caused them to, to die. And the only way they were able to do that was by actually analyzing their bones, analyzing their bodies. And they found that when you put like a photo film next to their bones and leave it for a while in the dark, and then you put like a control, like a regular mm -hmm. bone with photo film, the photo film was literally growing, glowing green, like neon green <laughs> after leaving it alone for a while. So that was like definitive evidence. Like, okay, yeah, this is, this is clearly yeah. like a messed up situation. And it's exactly matches the type of materials with that they were working at their jobs every day. They would even like lick their fingernails and stuff like that. Yeesh. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. I, when was that? When, when were people putting um, radiation on their skin to to glow? That seems like something that would be like 60s culture. It, oh, I guess it was. No, it was in the 1920s. It was even earlier. Oh, really? The okay. 30s, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's interesting. And then, of course, the most recent form of forensics is digital forensics, right? So yeah. the thing that I find interesting just about forensics in general is that you're creating a holistic view of the person's mind, their state of mind, and where they are physically to mm -hmm. see if they could be the person that committed this crime. So as far as determining their physical location, it's so much easier now that we have digital forensics because almost everyone carries around some sort of smartphone in their pocket. Yeah. And most people don't know this, but even when your iPhone has completely died, run out of battery, turned off, it can still run for more than four days by tracking your location, even without just on its backup uh, battery power. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like, if you have your phone with you, no matter what, you know, airplane mode, if it's off, it's, if it's out of battery, it still will track you more, you know, that's like a good rule mm -hmm. of thumb. And then obviously there's so much surveillance now, like, you know, streetlight cameras, security cameras from stores. I mean, all of the pictures people take, the videos they take on their, on their phones. So the, the likelihood of you going from your home to the, the scene of a, cr of a crime to commit a murder and not having hundreds of cameras catch you is very low nowadays. I mean, unless you're living yeah. in some like very rural area that hasn't had this, uh, this new wave of technology, yeah. but that's, that's one of the biggest tools that investigators have now. Yeah. I mean, it's way easier to reconstruct the past, which is essentially yeah. what, what we're trying to do with forensic science. And I'm also really interested in uh, digital forensics because this is one of those things where people can you can go back and falsify data so if, if there's like a paper trail of emails for example and you're trying to figure out if there was collusion for something um, you can typically go back through and or, or forensic science will go back through and try to reconstruct the intent of these people and everything else um, but it's also possible to go back and reconstruct the data itself Hmm. and try to cover up the tracks of as a criminal you can cover up your own tracks uh the problem is 
there's a lot of data that the end user doesn't really see, and that's metadata. That's right. all of the data about the data that you're trying to change. And yeah. it's really hard to go back and, like, you can go and change a whole bunch of metadata about, you know, previous documents that have flown through, but it's a lot harder to do that because there's so much right. information associated with it and you need to get everything right. exactly right. Typically it'll get stored in the cloud somewhere and you can't change that copy. Mm -hmm. Or if you do change the metadata, there might be a trail of you changing that data. And I mean, just generally, it seems mm -hmm. like whenever you're considering doing something big, you're going to do some research. Like if, I mean, and this is how they've caught many criminals, including, I think this was the case with Casey Anthony who killed her kids, but basically mm -hmm. they, you know, they look at their Google search history and they've searched like, what's the best way to dispose of a body or what are the least <laughs> painful ways to kill someone or, or whatever it is. And that this sort of fits into the larger trend that we've talked about, about people treat their phones as an extension of their mind. Like this is the AI component of anyone's mind is their phone. And so people rely on that heavily to do things in an intelligent way. You know, searching Google, finding information, doing your research, doing your homework. That's what any good criminal would do, but mm -hmm. that leaves a trail. So it's, yeah. it's uh, you know, I mean, you can use burner phones, you can use public Wi-Fi, like with yeah. the Silk Road guy did for, for a long time before he was caught, but it's really hard to not you know, screw up somewhere along the way. Yeah, and what, some, what a lot of people do is um, they'll try to remain anonymous. So the data is out there about somebody right. searching this, Use but they VPN. have to. Yeah, VPNs, or uh, more specifically, um, if they're looking on the internet, they'll use something well they'll use the dark web which you can yeah. get through with like a tor browser or something mm -hmm. which has a lot of really obscure um websites and that's there's apparently a lot of really scary things that go on there like you can hire hitmen you can hire a lot of um really shady people to do yeah, things we don't for recommend you on it. the dark yeah no 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 obviously <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, people are people are going to look at our browsing history for the research of <laughs> yeah, this podcast like... and be like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found it interesting to think about how could you get away with a murder in 2019 mm -hmm. with all the technology. And it's it's hard to think about. It's hard to think of a way that you could possibly get away with it. I mean, because even if, let's say, you have a mask on so they can't do facial recognition, you have gloves on and everything so that they can't take any of your, you know, fingerprint or DNA. Even then, it'd be really hard not to have cameras capture you going from wherever you start to the crime and seeing the mask and then finding out, okay, who sells these masks? Where could it have been bought from? Is it on Amazon? What were the recent sellers? Where did it deliver? What's the type? Yeah. Oh, there's a little strand of cotton that fell off them you know what i mean it's like there are so many ways that you can be caught that mm -hmm. it's it's uh almost impossible i mean if you think about what china is like now it is yeah. literally impossible to get away with a crime i mean the amount of cameras they have and the amount of information they have on every single citizen is just mind-blowing i mean even like i saw this video from this this uh reporter in china who i who I follow, who I love it, retweet him on our Twitter pretty okay. often. Um, but he just showed a video today of Chinese school children who, when they go to school, they go through a facial recognition, um, like, like a turnstile, so that it basically mm -hmm. scans their face, they go through the turnstile, and then they go into class. And if you think about what kind of data that mines, you're knowing like when these kids go to school, what their emotional state is when they get to school, like if there's any irregularity in their behavior compared to their historic behavior. And if you think about this, like being tracked from an early time in someone's life all the way through their adulthood and just using machine learning to find if there's any weird behaviors 
I mean, you can very quickly narrow a population of billions down to a, a small number of people who might be, uh, you know, good suspects. And that's where this is heading. And I mean, we should we should maybe we should talk about the future scenarios now because it's it's sort of trending in that direction. But I have high hopes and I also have big concerns. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's get into them. All right, Justin, what do you think is the worst case scenario for the future of forensics? Worst case scenario. So my worst case and and best case both involve forensic technology getting really, really good. Um, But with the worst case scenario, I would say that um, the... It also depends on the policy of the country that is um, running this really good forensic technology. So is it something like China where crimes are potentially like thought crimes, like thinking wrongly about the state or something along those lines? Not having the right opinion. Yeah, or or the other thing when, when a country has too much power, if somebody in power is the one that um, is the actual criminal, they might just falsify that and frame somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I think I think we need like true democracy for this to really be good. And it can be it can end up being really bad if this power is given to a country that doesn't care for the common man. Yeah. Um, and that's I mean that's essentially the worst case. Is it, I mean it's going to get really good, but also the falsification techniques get really good so there's almost going to be no way to like really combat the state if their if their voice is law um yeah yeah i have a similar worst case and i agree it really just depends on who's in power what the policies are mm -hmm. what are the values that are driving these forensic techniques and in the past we've seen that the worst case was using forensics in an in a biased way so you would have a courtroom someone would hire a forensic specialist and that person basically just does whatever they can to prove that side whereas Mm -hmm. what should happen and which is actually starting to happen in some states is you just hire a forensics team that does an unbiased analysis of the information not even knowing like who's the defendant, like anything about it. It's really just a scientific exercise where they say, hey, here's a body, tell us what you think happened. And that's mm-hmm. a much better approach where it's unbiased, it's a separate organization. There's, an, It's not yeah. like this forensic expert on this side, that forensic expert on that side. And yeah. I think as long as we can keep that independence and keep the, the, the good scientific practices Mm -hmm. and maintain our values where we don't consider, you know, thought to be a crime or having the wrong opinion to be a crime or, you know, just wanting to say what you think. As long as we have the right laws in place, then I think that we'll be in a good place. And the final thing I'll say is that I also agree with you that the best case and the worst case are very similar as far as what is technologically feasible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I see a situation in the far future where you just know absolutely everything about a person if you need to know. So you know what goes on inside their body, like mm. their emotional state, their cortisol levels, the stress levels. You also mm-hmm. know what's going on inside their mind. Like what have they been searching recently? What have their facial expressions been? What sort of emotions have they had? And like exactly where they've mm-hmm. been, what their behavior is by, you know, geo tracking and digital indicators and surveillance and mm-hmm. all of that. And that's great if you're using it to find the person who kidnapped your kid. But right. it's not good if they're using it to find, you know, protesters who are protesting a just cause to give mm-hmm. people freedom. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's so my worst case is where it's forensic techniques are used in a corrupt or biased way. Yeah. And the other thing to point out about a worst case is sometimes, and especially in the past, people have been certain 
that certain types of forensic techniques work. Like uh, the lie detector used to be used as a way to determine right. if somebody was you know, actually telling the truth about something. But it turns out that there's way more that goes on um, mm -hmm. that you can't really use that as evidence. And there's they also um, used to use like teeth marks or something along those yeah. lines as like a as an identification of something. Um, yeah, they so used that in the uh, Ted Bundy case. That was actually really? one of the things that got him convicted, which is good because he actually did the murders. Yeah. But but uh, yeah, they've largely considered teeth marks to be bunk science by now. Yeah. Well, I'm glad it worked in that case, but I'm yeah. also I'm curious about the other times where it didn't work because I just it really frustrates me when I hear about somebody who was convicted and, you know, was in prison for 30 years and it turns out they were not yeah. guilty. Yeah. And like we need we need the accuracy of these systems to be good and we need to understand what the level of uncertainty around certain forensic techniques are. Right. Well, and that's kind of the short term problem. Yeah. And that that brings up something that I wanted to mention, which is vertopsies virtual autopsies hmm. and this is something that has just started to be used but it's not that widespread yet where basically rather than using the classic method of doing an autopsy by cutting into them you know typically they cut a y shape from the collarbones hmm. and then down the stomach and then they remove the breastplate and it's yeah. all i mean it's very much in line with the word autopsy itself which is to see for yourself and okay. it kind of kind of serves the curiosity that people have. But a much better method would be to scan the body digitally using MRIs and CAT scans and other techniques. Mm. And then you have a record that A, it might miss, it might catch something that the human eye might miss, like, you know, very small uh, incisions or very small blood clots or things like that. Mm -hmm. And B, it preserves the record so that down the road, if we have better technology, we can then solve cold cases and review the evidence and it hasn't already been destroyed by slicing into it and, and you know, mm -hmm. all that other stuff. But to your point, that could also be used to falsify evidence. If you can mm -hmm. create like a fake digital autopsy and you just pay off the, the coroner, yeah. then obviously that's terrible. But on the good side, you can review evidence for cold cases and prove someone's innocence and prove that someone else was really the guilty one based on having this record preserved digitally. Yeah. And one thing I, I'd also like to mention here, is, and maybe we talk about uh, the best case, but um, just in general, a concept that has been interesting recently is um, using blockchain for non-cryptocurrency things. And really what a blockchain is, is it's it's a way to, it's a database where you can essentially store the, a record of changes through time. So for example, th this uh, virtual autopsy is a really good way to do this, where essentially the initial autopsy is stored like in the genesis block of a blockchain, mm. for example. But if somebody tried to falsify that data, you could see how that data changed through time, if it was replaced in any way. And I think that um, this, this sort of technology that isn't really widespread yet, because you know there haven't been really good ways to scale out uh, blockchain databases, um, but it could be a way to save criminal evidence or court mm -hmm. evidence. Um, and make sure that things don't get tampered with. And this is particularly useful for digital things where we can yeah. store everything in a digital fashion. Um, right. So that, that might be one of the techniques that's, that are used in you know, the worst and best case where yeah. we're hoping the forensic techniques get way better and better. Well, let's the move problem... on to the best case. Okay, yeah. Best case scenario. What do you think about it? Yeah, well, I agree with you that the best case scenario includes a lot of digital techniques. That does seem to be where a lot of the innovation is happening. Mm -hmm. And as far as what the goal is, the best case in my mind is creating an unbiased set of facts to figure out who committed a crime with much greater certainty than in the past. Because in the past, 
a lot of who got convicted and who didn't had to do with status, social status. You know, a black man 200 years ago was way more likely to be convicted than a white man if they went to court against each other. Same thing with a landowner against a non-landowner or a man against his wife. I mean, there are so many areas where there's bias in the system. And mm-hmm. the thing that forensic forensics really offers is an unbiased way to verify the facts. Yeah. And so my best case scenario includes furthering those techniques so that we can create an even more unbiased way to get to the truth. And that includes mm-hmm. things like a super fingerprint analysis. So this is a technique where not only will you know who left these fingerprint marks, but you'll also know when they were left. And mm. this is useful because basically the oil, all of the oils and proteins and stuff from your fingers, those change over time. When I touch my computer yeah. screen, it's going to have a different uh, assemblage of oils an hour from now mm-hmm. than it does like right after I touch it. So that's an interesting technique. Also, mobile instant DNA testing. This is something that's very early on. It's just getting started. But they found a way, theoretically now, to embed CRISPR technology into a mobile device so that basically these forensic experts can go to the scene of a crime and then basically just scan DNA. And it, like mm-hmm. after a couple minutes, it'll just pull up like any matches. And if you combine that with the whole genetic genealogy database, like like Ancestry.com and all Mm -hmm. that, you could pretty much instantly just know, okay, who are the main suspects? And that's huge if this suspect is still on the loose. I mean, you could literally save someone's life by having this process be much quicker. You know, right now it often takes 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours to Mm -hmm. to get a list of suspects. That could happen within minutes in the future. Um, Another interesting thing I'll I'll talk about is electronic noses. So in crimes, you know, dogs have played a big part in finding who the criminal is, like who the suspect is. They'll they'll have them sniff a little bit of the victim's clothing. There are all of these ways that we use dogs to to solve crimes. And now Mm. there are innovations being made to have these capabilities in a programmatic digital device. So you could basically just program like what it is you're looking for and then it'll light up or give some sort of indicator if that substance is nearby, if that chemical is nearby. Um, Hmm. And then the final piece of technology I'd like to discuss is the idea of mapping out a crime scene in its entirety using drones fitted with lasers to create a 3D model of a crime scene. And this is something that already does exist today I mean, it's the Mm -hmm. same way that construction workers or archaeologists map out exactly what a building looks like, you know, similar with like the CAD method for architecture. Mm -hmm. But basically, you just fly this drone over a crime scene, like let's say it's like in the middle of a like intersection on the road, Mm -hmm. and then it'll basically just shoot out lasers and in 10 minutes, it can create a 3D map of the crime scene. And if you combine that with like, taking, you know, instant DNA spots and then mapping that to where the crime is. You just have all of a sudden you have a whole, basically a virtual copy of this crime that took place. And that's just such a such an accurate way of getting to the bottom of of what really Mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. So question, did you see that Black Mirror episode where there was basically they could go and read someone's memories? Yeah, they plug up these people. Do you think something like that would be part of a best case or part of a worst case? Um, I mean, it, it could be either. But yeah. you, you could imagine in the near future, some you know, rather than holding a phone, you just have a hearable and you have some sort of like cool looking glasses. And that is basically that basically augments your ability to go around the world and use the power of computers and digital technology. Mm-hmm. And if that's recording things all the time, then that would likely be admissible in court as evidence. And mm-hmm. the thing, the one thing that concerns me is when you're finding out who could be a potential suspect, you may end up finding that even though someone didn't commit this crime, they may have done other things that are bad. And so you, it might turn into a situation where it's like 
people are being investigated for lots of unrelated things that although they may be illegal aren't that bad just because you know we're getting so good at figuring out any possible wrongdoing that someone could have i mean like i you know i used to like throw eggs at cars on halloween and stuff like that and like <laughs> i feel like that was an important part of my childhood but <laughs> but like you wouldn't be able to do that in the future like you'll get caught yeah <laughs> and that's that was one of the things i was wrestling with in the best case because really you know to put it you know to just kind of put it in one sentence if we have a future without crime like that would be the best case would but it you also have well but again that's that's like a future it's, it's would a future without evil of... be good or would it just be totally boring <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's, I think there's a scale of criminality and a scale of evil that, yes, we probably want like the true evil out of the world, but we don't want all crime out of the world because rebellion is a crime. We want people yeah. to have a voice. I'm, I'm talking about like the truly, uh, the truly sinister, malevolent. Yeah. yeah. Like the murders, rapes, like those types, those types of crimes. I want those out of the world forever. Like, yeah. I, I well, think the that good, the good only... thing about about rape is that it's pretty hard to get away with it now because just by the nature of the activity you are going to leave some of your like even if you wear a condom you're going to leave some of your cells in yeah. there so that's becoming a harder and harder crime for criminals to get away with and really any crime of passion you know there's the there's the famous quote that every touch leaves a trace any contact and when you have a crime of passion it's very hard to not have some sort of exchange of oils or skin cells or DNA or something. Yeah. And in the, in the future, hopefully we can, you know, get that number down to zero. But one of the problems now is people don't even necessarily like speak out about it. Or I think it's, it's the culture around it is changing, but you know, in the past people just wouldn't say anything. So there was nothing to investigate. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, if things get better and better and we can truly convict somebody, even if they're a powerful person of something like this, that would be really the best case. Right. Um, so, so obviously it's simplistic to say a world without crime is the best case because there's a lot of nuance to your definition. Well, that just of reminds me of the quote that, have you ever noticed that in heaven all the boring or all the interesting people are missing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's true. It's like... Who wants to hang out with a bunch of boring do-gooders for all eternity, singing kumbaya in the clouds? Like, <laughs> I'd way rather be like, you know, playing dice with with, you know, interesting like Dostoevsky and like I don't know, interesting like crazy minds. Um, yeah. So you have to you have to draw the line somewhere of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and really it boils down to who is in power. Who right. is drawing the line of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable? And then the, the other question that arises from this topic is, okay, you caught the criminal. He did it. What do you do now? Because in the past, we focused mainly on punishment. Like how do, we, how do we get retribution against this guy? Yeah. But it may be more beneficial for society to treat it as rehabilitation. How can we get mm -hmm. this guy to a place where he's no longer a threat to himself or anyone else? And I've, I read this interesting story recently where these inner city schools, this one school in particular, had a really high rate of suspensions. And they found that no matter how much they suspended kids or disciplined them or sent them to detention, the problems only got worse and worse and worse. So then they hired this new person who came in. And when kids came to detention, it wasn't a typical detention. It was a yoga and meditation class. And they had this like really cool <laughs> dude who like the kids loved basically teach mindfulness to these kids. And they've had incredible results. The amount of suspensions has gone way down. And just by getting kids to reflect on their actions, to breathe and to, you know, to, to take a moment before they let their emotions take over has had mm -hmm. great effects. And I think the more we can sort of position the, criminal justice system for rehabilitation rather than retribution, you know, the better society will be. Yeah. If you think about how difficult that task is going to be though, because I mean, especially for the, the big crimes, you think of 
I, I know me personally, when I think of somebody like Ted Bundy, I just get this visceral reaction. Yeah. Like that person needs to be gone. Like right. he needs to be like out of this well, world. Well, he's an extreme but, case, but especially yeah. like younger kids who, you know, first offenders who come from a tough background who like rob a seven eleven, like yeah. there's no way to say that there's no coming back from that, especially with younger mm-hmm criminals and and some people just have a a messed up mind like ted bundy may be better categorized as someone who's sick in the sense that he's a sociopath and that may not be able to be resolved without surgery or some sort of some sort of medication or chemical or something so have you is it uh charles whitman that was the shooter at the university of texas back in i think the 70s i think that's right um, well, anyways, he, he was the guy that uh, basically had a rifle and shot a whole bunch of people from a tower um, on a university campus. Um, but it turned out that he wrote this letter, you know, to his family or to everybody that said, do an autopsy of me, basically, because something is wrong. I, oh, I need to do this. Right. And it turned out he had, he had a, brain, a tumor. brain tumor that was like pushing up. I think it was against his amygdala, some some emotional regulation. Yeah. Um, and there are things that, like there are biological things that can make people more impulsive, more aggressive. And I think the more we understand biology, the more we understand the neurology of different yeah. behaviors like this, this rehabilitation thing is going to be possible. Right. But we need we need better um, science around that first, I think. Yeah, I mean, all of this information works together to paint a picture of this person. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's what's going on inside their mind and it's what's going on inside their actual physical brain. It's also the background that they came from. I mean, we're basically getting to the point where it's like, you know, whoever controls all the surveillance information is like Santa Claus, like literally knows Mm -hmm. everything you've done or thought about. And right now, if you think about something, but you don't type it into Google, you don't type it on your notes app in your phone, those thoughts mm-hmm. are still private. But I wonder how long it'll be before even that is mineable yeah. data. Yeah, I mean, I, I would imagine that in certain countries, it already is to some extent. Um, so yeah. Well, yeah, especially... we already can map like basic words with basic areas of the brain lighting up it's just a very rough approach right now well but... yeah right i meant more like you can kind of see someone's behavior like their body their um oh right body language and everything else it kind of gives an indication of what this person is thinking but yeah i mean there is going yeah. to be a time where if especially if we merge like if if ai becomes a thing and people just have to merge somehow if they don't want to be left in the dust intellectually um if you merge with an AI, it will know your thoughts. At least it'll have a rough like idea. Like a brain of machine your interface. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so if if you which have for listeners, this... a brain machine interface is basically like if you could control your iPhone with your thoughts, and we're not actually that mm-hmm. far away from that. We should maybe do an episode on. Yeah, brain machine I don't know what the latest is on Elon Musk's Neuralink company. Yeah. But but there are a few companies that are trying to make these brain machine interfaces because they see this as the only way to um, combat the coming general AI is to just merge with it through these brain machine interfaces. Um, yeah, I mean, I would. Yeah, well, I wouldn't <laughs> phrase it that way because it's it's just a little bit scary to be like, we want to get left with the other meat slabs, or do you want to <laughs> join us in the new way? It's like. All right, I'll be with my meat slabs playing checkers. Thank you very much. But, <laughs> but you know, I do see that, like, I would say more from the realm of, like, if you want to be as productive and as intelligent and as capable as you can be, mm. then you would benefit by being able to control your iPhone with your thoughts rather than having to actually, like, convert into words and then type the words out and then get the results you could just do so much more that people who are high powered and are already sort of, you know, lean in that direction will be early adopters. And then 
other people will be more pressured to do so as well because there will already be this other group that is even more capable than the smartest people who aren't using brain machine interfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean that that's one of those things that probably will be used in forensics of the future. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, Good. do we need to talk about the likely scenario now or? Yeah, let's, up? let's finish it with the likely scenario. Most likely scenario. What's your most likely? So it's actually, um, a combination of the best and worst case, depending okay. on the country, because I think the likely scenario is we do get extremely good forensic technology we get just better at reconstructing the past based on whatever data has been saved through time what data we have now etc um but the difference will be between countries i think um certain countries let's say the nordic countries i don't i don't foresee those types of countries um being particularly um, draconian in their, you know, laws for how they, you know, track people and what they convict people of. On the other hand, North Korea, China, some of these other totalitarian uh, governments, I think that they might put too much emphasis on some of these things and convict people of crimes that most people wouldn't consider crimes, um, especially the common person. So. Yeah, I think it's just going to be distributed differently depending on what the policies, the culture, the values of different countries are. Yeah, I agree. That's that's very in line with my most likely scenario. Forensics is likely to develop at a much faster rate in China and anywhere where there aren't legal obstacles to implementing this tech. So like mm -hmm. you mentioned, the Nordic countries probably are going to have even greater legal obstacles than the United States because they value uh, privacy to a greater extent even mm -hmm. than the US. So that's probably going to be the biggest thing holding back forensic tech in the US. Like for instance, the GEDmatch site that caught the Golden State Killer, they used to just opt everyone in automatically to solve mm -hmm. murder cases, but then they used, a mur they used an, uh, the site for an attempted murder rather than an actual murder. And there was this big mm. backlash of their users saying like, what the hell, we only agreed in, in cases of the most serious crimes. Now you're using it for attempted crimes. That seems a little, um, mm -hmm. a little bit of a far reach. And so then they changed their policy so that now you have to specifically opt in to it being used in law enforcement. And mm. that hasn't really slowed the development of the field much, but you can see that there are going to be these this sort of pendulum swinging back and forth in america between privacy and justice but that pendulum is swinging only in one direction in places like china and so i think when we look at the forensic technology development there that'll give us a glimpse into our own future we are yeah i think that's, that's a really good way to put it very, very Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for listening. This has been what the has future happened, of forensics. What is current? And we hope to see you next time. And what will inevitably happen? The past, the present, and the future. Our computer is picking up a strange signal. The past, the present, and the future, baby. What's the world coming to? The past, the present, and the future.
Hey futurists, if you've made it this far, you might be wondering who created the Hence the Future theme song. It was created by the Walden Brothers, and you can find them on Spotify. The Walden Brothers also produced the sound bites for the worst case, the best case, and the most likely future scenarios. At Hence the Future, we're always looking for ways to improve the quality of our episodes and our predictions. To that end, we're building a team of researchers to curate the most authoritative and highly vetted sources as the foundation for every episode. If you'd like to support these efforts, you can donate a small monthly amount at anchor.fm slash hence the future. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support.